Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Business Ethics. Today, we are going to be talking about corporate social responsibility. So before we get into the heavy details, I wanted to bring up uh, the two main questions, really, that we're going to be thinking about in this module in module three. So first and foremost, what obligations do corporations have? Um, and then second, whose interests should a corporation focus on? Should the goal be to maximize profit? Should this goal be constrained in any way? And uh, while today we're clearly going to be thinking about the first question, this question of what kinds of obligations corporations have, as we'll quickly see, this second question about the interests that a corporation should focus on, i.e. the, the who, um, whose interests we should focus on, are going to, um, are, it's, a, it's a question that's very closely related or is um, often interconnected or tied up with, it, with the kinds of obligations that we think a corporation or a business has. <clears throat> so in the previous module period, we were talking a lot about, thinking a lot about individual obligations. In this module period, we're going to be thinking more specifically about corporate obligations. So we're moving directly into the realm of business ethics. Now there's a couple of things that I want us to keep in the back of our minds as we're, as we're thinking through these different views concerning corporate, corporate obligations and the kinds of, um, and, the, and whose interests um, a business uh, or a corporation ought to pursue, ought to, ought to hold as primary. So first and foremost, everyone needs to remember that corporations do not operate within a, a vacuum. Um, there are ethical concerns that guard against unsustainable business practices. Um, and in doing so, in, in keeping those kinds of ethical concerns in mind, often, as we'll see um, <clears throat> uh, several philosophers argue, this will keep the market healthy. So this is the idea that business ethics and, um, and, uh, and corporate interests can go hand in hand. Um, and this is something that was discussed in the, in the Sen reading when he talked about protecting um, against exploitative trading of goods, ensuring production does not result in unlivable environments, right? Making sure that the, that the land and the, and the manufacturing process necessary for a corporation to, um, or necessary for corporations to, uh, sell certain products and engage in the market um, that they don't result in an unlivable earth. Um, that is ultimately the livable earth. Maintaining that is something that is going to be in the long-term interests of businesses. Uh, so um, these are the sorts of things that we want to keep in mind that um, it's not just necessarily a matter of having the freedom to start a business and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do well because you're providing some kind of product that the people really want, that doesn't happen in isolation, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are considerations that must be kept in, kept in mind, like ensuring that the earth remains a livable place. So there are still, so in the future, far, far future, um, there are consumers around to purchase products. The second thing that I want us to keep in mind, especially as, uh, as we're thinking through some of the implications of Friedman's arguments, is that uh, there is an urgent need to address complex social problems that stem from racism, classism, gender inequality, and the intersections thereof. So this was something that I saw many of you care deeply about and have, uh, have a lot to say about. Um, this was, that was something that I noticed in the, in the previous discussion forums. 
So if that's something that is important to you, um, <clears throat> it's something that you really want to bear in mind um, when we're thinking about what kinds of obligations we want to we want to place on corporations, um, whether if left to their own devices, uh, corporations would resolve the issues that stem from racism, classism, and gender equality and the intersections thereof, um, if, they're, if they're capable of, of solving those things on their own. So with those two things in mind, I'd like us now to turn to a um, uh, the one of <clears throat> perhaps one of the um, broadest or one of the broader ways that we can understand what this term corporate social responsibility means. Um, <clears throat> for any of you who are familiar with that term, I'm sure one of the first things that you notice about it or you've noticed about it is that it seems like Corporate social responsibility has its fingers in a lot of different pies. Um, and if you've had the sense or the thought has crossed your mind that there is no one clear definition of what that term means, then uh, you're definitely in, on the right track in thinking about that. There's a lot of debate about what corporate social responsibility looks like. In general though, it concerns responsibilities that a corporation has concerning how it impacts society. So let's watch this video and. Related to the company's core business. Mass layoffs and record profits at the same time, manager salaries, scarcity of natural resources, and imminent climate catastrophes, morally questionable advertising, child labor, corporate fraud, financial crisis, and the Occupy Wall Street movement. These are just a few examples you may have heard about under the topic of sustainability, business ethics, or corporate social responsibility. These themes raise questions about justice for current as well as for future generations. We want to ask corporate social responsibility, CSR for short, what is this? This man made headlines a few years ago. In 2004, Angelo Ugolotti learned from investigators that he was chairman of the board of several companies set up by his employer, the Italian milk concern Parmalat. Angelo, however, had not even heard of those companies. At Parmalat, he was only responsible for the switchboard. You can imagine how the story goes. Corporate fraud at its best. Bogus companies, cooking the books, bribery, accounts in the Cayman Islands, the whole works. The task of corporate social responsibility is to prevent these and other morally reprehensible practices which can weaken society, damage companies and hurt employees. More and more companies have realized the relevance of moral practices in their businesses, even though they have not always sufficiently implemented CSR yet. Concrete preventative measures are often labeled risk management, a term more commonly used for avoiding financial risks and damage to a company's reputation. No one likes bad press, right? Thus, companies define clear rules, so-called compliance or value management systems. For example, you can accept a bottle of wine from the supplier, but you have to pass up a golfing trip to Hawaii. However, risk and compliance management are only one aspect of corporate responsibility correctly understood. Firstly, CSR is not just about preventing bad practices like corruption and fraud and so on. Secondly, this approach does not question a company's business activities as such. In fact, compliance management could be an efficient control mechanism even in organizations like the Mafia. 
The more challenging question is, how can companies contribute to a good society through good business practices? Oh, that's easy, they say. We'll create a charity foundation or donate a lot of money and thus do good. Wrong. That won't hurt and may even help, but it's not systemic change. The important thing is, CSR is about how companies make profits, not about how they spend them. Corporate social responsibility must not simply be the repair center of capitalism. It has to demand systemic change in a market economy. This requires a new role for the key players in this game. Companies must become not only economic, but also moral actors. What's required and important is a stronger integrative perspective based on a system of deontological values and which is closely related to the company's core business. This means social and ecological criteria must be taken into consideration. For example, in the treatment of employees, organization of the production process, offered and produced products and services, and responsible business practices of suppliers, the so-called supply chain. By the way, virtuous managers or the honorable merchant alone will not suffice. We need employees of integrity at all levels of the company, but we also need organizational structures and clear rules. But relying on a code of conduct is also short-sighted, because in extreme cases, it means act according to some given rules, which is the opposite of ethical reflection, namely actual thinking about good and evil, right and wrong. In other words, CSR is always about both individuals and institutional structure. In business ethics, one speaks of individual ethics and institutional ethics. But isn't that unrealistic? Shouldn't the state do more to promote a good and fair society? Granted, it is unrealistic, and that's exactly why such questions are important. Business ethicists don't just ask what the world is like, but also what it should be like, how it ought to be. At the very least, we want to suggest where the journey should lead. At the same time, we want to make practical suggestions about how to embark on that journey. One speaks of questions of justification on the one hand and of implementation on the other preferably in that order. The state, particularly through politics and law, can contribute to the implementation of corporate responsibility, but only within a limited range. If we look at society from a bird's eye view, we can spark different social systems. The economic system, the political system, the justice system, for example. One can speak of the functionally differentiated society we live in. About 60 or 70 years ago, some German economist came up with an idea that led to the development of the social market economy as we know it, particularly in Europe. The thought that a market economy should be embedded in a political framework that determines the rules of the game. This underlying idea is still important, but it has become distinctly more difficult to rely on the state alone. Societal differentiation has progressed because most systems have internationalized. Globalization is the magic word that applies to most systems, but not all of them. Politics, and particularly law, tend to be bound to one country's borders, while the economy, above all, is highly internationalized and globalized. This makes effective regulation difficult. Thus, it is now not only about the classic rules of the game, but also about the moves of the players, the corporations, in a changed and changing world. And beyond politics and law, civil society, in particular NGOs, have gained a strong influence in the economy, as both vicious watchdogs and as partners of business. In the society... All right, so... First and foremost, that video will be posted onto the Blackboard. So if you uh, if you would like to watch it again, um, it will be made available to you. As I'm sure all of you noticed, there is a lot going on. The answer of what CSR is, how it should be implemented, who implements it, and what kinds of policies um, and uh, constraints on behaviors and obligations that corporations have are highly, uh, highly complex. So um, if you felt a little lost in the video, that's a good thing because it should show you that the answer of what CSR is and the kinds of obligations that it places on corporations is a very, very complicated and hard question to answer.
So with that in mind, I would like us to now turn to how Friedman understands corporate social responsibility. So here's a quote from the paper um, that you, or the rather the article that you were assigned. Corporate social responsibility, according to Friedman, must mean that he is to act, that is the manager, is to act in some way that is not in the interest of his employers, i.e. the stakeholders. For example, that he, again, the manager, is to refrain from increasing the price of the product in order to contribute to the social objective of preventing inflation, even though a price increase would be in the interest of the corporation or that he is to make expenditures on reducing pollution beyond the amount that is in the best interests of the corporation, or that's required by law in order to contribute to the social objective of improving the environment, or that at the expense of the corporate profits, he is to hire hardcore unemployed instead of uh, the hardcore, hardcore unemployed, instead of the better qualified available workmen to contribute to the social objective of reducing poverty. So according to Friedman, corporate social responsibility very much concerns or almost exclusively concerns how the management of um, how, how managers, um, uh, how um, profit and corporate assets are managed by managers. So essentially, <clears throat> the choices that they make to inhibit profit for the larger social good that's the kind that is that that is the type of CSR that Friedman has in mind. Now, as we saw in the in the video, the notion of corporate social responsibility is far more complicated than that. Um, so when we think about what Friedman is trying to argue we see that the basis of the claim that the executive or manager is imposing something on other stakeholders unfairly, undem undemocratically, unwisely, and in violation of the trust, of a trust. Um, what he concludes is that the only social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits. So the way that he spells this out and again, this is a quote from the article that everyone read. Here, the businessman self-selected self or appointed directly or indirectly by stockholders or um, uh, uh, shareholders is to be simultaneously legislator, executive, and jurist. He is to decide whom to tax, how much, and for what purpose. So again, like I said in the previous slide, this is something he, Friedman understands CSR as exclusively as the management of profit and corporate assets. Um, it's essentially uh, um, a back and forth between um, making a business money, making a corporation money, and taking it away. It's very uh, linear in that sense. So based off of this very, um, this very limited view of what corporate social responsibility looks like, uh, Friedman argues that, uh, that given the kinds of responsibilities that managers have to stakeholders, or, um, or sorry, rather shareholders, um, that the, their only social responsibility is to simply increase the profits. Now, um, that might seem a little limited, but he appeals to some ideas connected with our democracy and the purpose of government to sort of back up this idea that uh, essentially corporations owe society, the societies in which they exist, absolutely nothing. Their only obligation is to maximize their profits as much as possible. 
Um, and he and he sort of grounds this idea or justifies that claim by arguing that doing otherwise would be unfair because it constitutes taxation without representation. That is, the um, the manager or the executive is dictating these changes, like I was saying, and um, determining how to uh, spend profits or um, corporate assets. Uh, or potentially limit the amount of money um, or the kind of profit that a business would make. And the person sitting in the manager's chair doing that is doing it based off of their own reasoning and their own sorts of, <clears throat> the way that Friedman understands it, their own sorts of like uh, personal, individual, subjective, moral sensibilities. They're not going to the board and this isn't, these aren't things that are agreed on. These are, these are changes that are being dictated by someone who's working as an employee of the people who ultimately own the business. Now he says this is undemocratic because it invests governmental power in a person who has no general mandate to govern. That is, it's the, these managers are trying to resolve these larger social issues and dumping essentially corporate profit or money into resolving these issues that they alone sort of decide um, are important. And there's no vote that happens uh, typically in Friedman's mind, the public um, is the one that votes on which sorts of uh, issues ought to be addressed. That's something that is, um, is uh, eventually uh, addressed or um, some kind of solution is um, established via some kind of democratically elected process, whether those are legislators or um, people who are appointed by people that um, that the public votes into votes into power. And this that process, that complex, you know, the the bureaucratic process, all of that um, is something that in Friedman's mind um, has no place um, in a corporate boardroom, essentially, that is doing work that not only the government ought to be doing, but there's just this one sort of, in Friedman's mind, random actor who's kind of going by their own whim in determining what things ought to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> secondly, he says, or sorry, third, he says that this is unwise because there are no checks and balances in the broad range of governmental power, um, thereby turned over to this uh, to this executive or this manager's discretion. So like I was saying, this person is sort of operating on their whim of like what they think that the right, you know, moral objectives the company ought to pursue. Um, and there's nothing to check this, uh, to check this power that's being exercised by the executive or the manager. Um, fourth, Friedman says that this is a violation of trust because the executive or manager is employed by the owners as an agent serving in the interest of his principal. So again, this is something, this lone actor, this is sort of the image or the picture that um, Friedman's trying to draw, this lone actor of the corporate executive deciding which sorts of social issues to address and using all the company or corporate resources in order to address them. Um, and that violates the reason why, according to Friedman, a, an executive is put into that position of power. The purpose, according to Friedman, of the, of the executive is to simply pursue the, uh, the best interests of the company, that is to increase, maximize the profits as much as possible. And finally, he says that this is uh, doing otherwise sort of pursuing um, this very limited notion of uh, corporate responsibility that he's that he's using here. Um, he says doing that is futile because the executive is unlikely to be able to, to anticipate the social consequences of his actions. And because as he imposes costs on his stockholders, customers, or employees, he is likely to lose their support and thereby lose their power. So ultimately, um, this lone, uh, moral, uh, renegade executive um, is eventually going to mess it up and uh, people aren't going to want to buy the product. 
he's going to lose the faith of the of the um of the shareholders or stockholders um and ultimately lose his job um and uh so that is sort of the <clears throat> that's what um friedman is saying backing up um, or defending his idea that the only social responsibility of businesses is to increase the profit. So essentially doing otherwise is unfair, undemocratic, undemocratic, unwise, a violation of trust and futile. Okay, so although Friedman or some of Friedman's views, especially when it comes to um, uh, the, you know, like the right to engage in a free market um, has been defended using coherent arguments. The argument that I just laid out is not a coherent argument. So um, I've noticed definitely in the, in the discussion board that there are some of you that are sympathetic to some of the things that Friedman has to say. Um, and I just wanna clarify that there might be a coherent defense of some of those views. However, on the whole, Friedman's argument is sort of notorious within academic circles for being, um, for being an incoherent, uh, argument, namely because uh, it's it's a it's something um, some of you might have heard the term fallacious. Um, it's a it commits a number of um, a number of fallacies. Um, and in general, what a fallacy is, is when someone's argument broken down into premises. So when we form arguments, there are premises in our arguments and those premises ideally are offer some really good support for us to accept the conclusion. All right. Um, and uh, and uh, people who form arguments commit fallacies when either their premises are false or they don't support the conclusion in the way that the arguer sort, sort of assumes or tries, tries to suggest that they do. So again, Friedman's conclusion is that the only social responsibility of businesses is to increase its profits and uses these points here, as well as some of these points here to, as the premises of his arguments. So uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, and as we saw in the video, Friedman's notion or understanding or definition of corporate social responsibility is very limited. There's a way in which we can understand corporate, so, corporate social responsibility. So it is not necessarily concerned with how corporations spend their profits. It's not this very um, exclusive like distribution of corporate assets or um, you know, choices that make money, choices that lose money. Um, and uh, consequently, um, the first three premises of the argument or three of the premises of the argument falls apart. This idea that there's a dictating of, um, of how funds are getting used by this one single person, right? Who's sitting sort of in the driver's seat, the executive or the manager. Um, as the video discussed, when we think about corporate social responsibility, it's something where we're thinking about individual actors, not only executives and managers, um, people that all of the employees um, in a company, including shareholders, or rather all of the employees of the company, as well as the shareholders, and something that's happening on an institutional level as well. So it's not just a matter of this one person sitting in this little driver's seat making all of these, um, making all these changes and things that are going against the best interests of the of the of the um, shareholders. It's something that is much bigger, broader, and far more complex than that. So as a result, all of these complaints that Friedman has concerning, you know, taxation without representation, it being undemocratic, and then also it being this unwise thing to allow this one single actor to dictate how a company's profits are spent. Um, 
those premises don't actually address this larger notion of CSR and whether that is something that um, that everyone involved with a corporation ought to um, ought to bear in mind. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, another fundamental flaw or large um, or sort of death blow that uh, you could hit um, Friedman's argument with is this idea that, uh, or the idea, his idea that we see um, in, the, in the bottom two um, premises here. He assumes that contributing to the public good is fundamentally at odds with shareholder interests. So he says that any which way you cut it, when it comes to how uh, how a a um, executive is going to is going to um, implement various CSR type practices um, or donations or something like this, uh, that is going that is sort of the only way that is the that's the only way that corporate this is what Friedman's assuming that's the only way that we contribute to the public good and doing those things necessarily come at the cost of um, of cutting back on the um, on the on the corporation's profits so like the video talked about there are a large variety of ways that um, that visit, that businesses um, or corporations um, or a lot, uh, there's a very broad way in which we can understand the types of res social responsibilities that businesses have. And if anything, this idea of, um, okay, yeah, so let's make all this money and then we'll donate a bunch of it is actually the wrong approach to take because like the video talked about, that doesn't get at um, systemic or institutional change uh, that we desperately need to address, especially when we think about things like climate change. Um, and like, we'll talk a lot about in, uh, in module in the module on um, on discrimination, like um, the various discriminatory practices that um, that are prevalent within um, definitely corporate America uh, today. So um, those kinds of those kinds of big, major, complicated social issues, throwing a bunch of money at them by being a business and giving to charity and then making yourself look all um, look all cute. Uh, to the consumer, that's that is actually discouraged by um, a lot of advocates for or a lot of people that advocate for corporate social responsibility. So this idea that Friedman has in mind that it kind of boils down to these, you know, giving giving to charity and um, ensuring fair wages and things like this. Uh, essentially like all of these uh, just like dumping corporate profit uh, into solving these these public these public issues is, um, if anything, exactly the wrong way to think about um, what corporate social responsibility is. Now, if we operate with a much more complicated, sort of harder to get our brains around concept of corporate social responsibility, we can start to identify various ways in which contributing to the public good is fundamentally um, not at odds with shareholder interests. Um, and this debate, this idea that ethical concerns are relevant to business practices is something that should sound familiar to us. Um, specifically, it was something that um, Sen discusses in that, in that, first, in that first reading about um, about business ethics. Um, if you remember, he uh, he really pushed back on the idea that people would use some of Adam Smith's writing to argue that there's no place for ethics in business. And as many of you discussed in the in the um, in the forums, um, this isn't the right way, or rather, not in the forums on your uh, on your first worksheet. This isn't the right way to interpret Adam Smith here. 
uh, in large part because ethical concerns, addressing ethical concerns can guard against unsustainable business practices, thereby protecting shareholder interests and keeping the market healthy. Um, so if we have that far more complex and sophisticated notion of corporate social responsibility in mind, we see that the that these two premises within Friedman, Friedman's article also falls apart. So this idea that some kind of violation of trust has happened. If an executive is implementing sustainable business practices that ultimately help the business stay around that, that are um, in the interest of long-term uh, goals for the business, then they're most certainly not violating the trusts of shareholders. They're actually doing a very good job protecting them. Nor is this something that's futile, right? Because if you have someone who's implementing various kinds of sustainable business practices that help the business stay in business a lot longer, that person, that executive, even if it is one person sort of taking the reins and dictating change, is not necessarily going to lose the trust of the shareholders or impose horrible costs um, on consumers um, or employees. Um, and ultimately, uh, there are various ways that they could do such a good job that they'll bolster their support um, versus losing that support and losing that sort of executive power. All right, so like I mentioned um, closer to the beginning of this lecture, uh, this isn't necessarily a problem for, um, for people that support or endorse various aspects of Friedman's view or principles that he, um, that, that he advocates for. Um, there are coherent, there might, or there, rather there might be coherent ways um, to defend some of those principles, uh, but at the very least, uh, the structure of his argument fails to ultimately support his conclusion that the only responsibility, social responsibility of, um, of corporations is to maximize profits. So um, with these things in mind, uh, we're going to be turning next to this question of stakeholder interests. Um, so stay tuned and please feel free to either reach out to me or post some questions in your, um, in your assigned groups uh, if you need to discuss anything further. All right, thanks so much everyone. Have a good rest of your day.